I would like really to try to round this conference up. I, I promised you this morning we will, we will start with uh, truth, and um, the truth is not always that tasty to, to us, um, but it's important to, to see man and his problems according to God's view and not to the way we would love it to be. And only if we really have God's anthropology or thinking of who man is, who he is created for, and what his problem is ever since the fall, only then, that's obvious, can we come to a proper diagnosis and also to a proper, may I use that word, therapy. Um, and so we finished off the last session with, um, with the, the statement the fall was much greater than many of us might think because before the fall there was truly one king and one kingdom and with the fall as many people came as many kin kingdoms were born because according to Genesis 3:5 we are ever since all after our own glorification and this is much bigger than just eating from an apple by the way, it was a fig in a Jewish mindset. It was not an apple. Um, that's much bigger than that. We became competitors, not to each other. That's the reason why you have problems in your marriage, because both of you are longing for, I want worship. I want you to join my choir, and I'm loving you as long as you join the choir of giving worship to myself. And the problem is, that's why Dave Swavely wrote this excellent book, When Sinners Say I Do. The problem is, the other counterpart sings the very same. Be surprised when you guys get married. They also look for that prince who gives glory to the princess. And it doesn't take long that this will show, out, show off. Um, it is important to see the big picture with God's eyes, because only then you are able, and that is, don't see that as an intimidation or as a demeanor, because the world can't handle that truth. But as Christians, this is grace, to have God's eyes, God's diagnosis, because therefore, then true hope is found. And that's what we would like to turn to. There is there's really a better life to be found. We also closed the last session by saying, you are a worshiper. You have to worship. That's your identity. God created you as a worshiper. And that, that makes you distinct from any, any other uh, being, especially uh, animals. Um, I picked on you guys a little bit. Why are you wearing the shoes you're wearing and the, trow the pants you're wearing? I mean, I totally relate because I, I was, and to a certain extent, I'm still the same. It's about acceptance, right? It's about the other guys. I mean, I want the red shoes. All the other guys have the red shoes. I'm so sorry. <laughs> we even haven't, ch hadn't, haven't had the chance to talk to each other yet. Uh, but I'm leaving tomorrow, so I'm safe. <laughs> um, but again, do the, do the proper diagnosis. Why are we doing things like that? It is because we are, we are, we are, we are longing for glory. We are we're addicts. This is in our heart. We have to worship. And too bad, I mean, I'm, I'm not judging you. I'm talking about myself now. Why do I have this very European coat, you know? This, uh, you know and uh, yesterday, at least, the very European shirt. Um, I, I want to be part of the group. I want to have identity. I want to, be, I, I want to identify with transcendence, with something bigger than me. That's why our guys... When there's a wedding, they post next to the Bugatti or the Ferrari. It was just a day, you know, a, a rental car. But still, they, they get the picture taken next to the Bugatti and post it right away on Facebook for all their friends, hoping that some of this glory of the Bugatti kind of flips over onto them. <laughs> yeah, we are laughing, but that's, that's what we are in for all our lives. And... Now we, I, I'm not here now to again repeat myself. I want to shift that now. This is, this is so unique, and this is such, 
I will even make the statement, this is the glory of man, that God has created you that way, but we have to use it not in this satanic way, but in God's way. We are geared for worship, and God has provided everything to fulfill this purpose, this, this, this life theme, by being our creator and by being our savior. He has done two works. First, the work of creation, and it seems like as soon as he was done with creation, he started a second work. That was the work of salvation, right? And, and those are, I don't find that too often in literature, but I believe those are two valid resources or sources you can draw from to be a proper worshiper. Even creation. When, when you talk about science, it's not just to get good grades in school or to make life easier because we have hospitals or other sciences. The, the, the first and foremost meaning for science is to be in awe. To be in awe of the one who is behind that. I mean, I had the privilege to be at the aquarium in Toronto the other day. This is unbelievable. Wendy, what is the name? An anemone? Oh, yeah. <laughs> ah, Anemonen, whatever that is in English. It, it, I don't know it's, whether it's an animal or a plant, but you can see every color possible. I've been into graphic design. I know a little bit about CMYK and RGB. No monitor in this world can display what the creator puts on display in this aquarium for your eyes. Oh, great. Evolution brings up such a beauty. Great. Why? In a, in, in a sea where nobody cares. You know, the fish don't care. <laughs> but you care because you're geared for worship. And, and you should be in awe. Next time you pray at the table, by the way, pray at the table and not in the conference hall. Well, next time you pray at the table, <laughs> do it the German way. Keep your eyes peeled. Keep them open. What are you praying for when you always keep your eyes shut? Look at, look at, I mean, you didn't have strawberries today, but whoever knows me, this is my example. <sighs> have you ever, ever, I'm talking to the men now. Women are better than that. I'm talking to the men. Have you ever taken the time to really look at a strawberry just for, and you count it, you have a smartphone, five minutes. That's a very long time to watch a, 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 a strawberry. But there is excitement in there. When you, when, you, when you look at the surface, don't bite right away, right? Look at the surface. It is a high, glossy surface. Tell me about the, the physician or the tech guy who can create such a paint which is so high, glossy, then on a, you have never seen that, I know. I'm so sorry, but next time when the, when the strawberries come back, look just for the skin, high, glossy. And then... In, ingrained, or whatever you say that in, in depth, it is, is a green seed in an organized chaos. And this green seed is, is always a little, in, in, there's an indention. And there are, I don't know how many seeds, but God knows. And when you count those strawberries, you'll find that every single seed is connected to a, a strunk. Is that a word? A, a centerpiece. And, and by the way, talking about colors, View this variety of red, from dark red on the outside to all the shades of red until it's white. And that's not just for the squirrels or whatever eats my strawberries in the garden. Uh, this is for you because you're geared for glory. So take the time to look at that. Or this little thing, how do you call that in the center, Wendy? Stamp? Yeah, whatever. The, the little thing in the, in the center. Have you ever... Have you ever paid attention to that stem? <laughs> when you really have this light, you will see there are crystals all around that stem. It's, it's as beautiful as a diamond. You don't believe that, but you believe, believe me, it's beautiful. And, and, the, and the, the most astonishing thing is, as soon as you touch that crystal, it's gone. Because it's just water. I don't know how God does it, but he does it every day for you to be in awe. You are a worshiper. The problem is you get so excited about man's creation in spite of God's creation. iPhone 7. 
dreaming of iPhone 7s? What is that? What is an iPhone 7s in two years from now? Nothing. It's garbage. <laughs> what are you dreaming for? You get the picture? And it is, it is a little funny right now, but I'm very serious. I really want you. That is, that is, that is one side what you've been created for. Created for uh, this is the purpose you've been created for, and this is one of his rev revelations in creation. Okay? And now comes his second work, salvation. And I talked to somebody during the break. We are far better off than Adam in his not fallen state. Because what was Adam able to see? He was, he was, he was looking at creation, and obviously he was in awe. There was no doubt about Darwin and, and, and evolution and stuff. You know, that, that came a little later. He was so, it was so clear to him, this is all by the hands of God. And he was in awe every day about that garden, whatever he saw. But what part of attributes did that garden reveal to Adam? It told him something, it told him something about God's creativity, about God's holiness, about God's might, about God's wisdom, infinite wisdom. In, you know, the best thing about the strawberry is you can eat it and you don't have to die. Seriously. I mean, if you do that, if the apple guy does it, you know, a strawberry from a laboratory, it might look close to what God has done, but you, don't, you never dare to touch it to eat it. You would die. <laughs> it's so chemical. But th this just pops out of dirt. And it's good for you. <laughs> yeah, it's really good for you. So Adam was able to be in awe of, of God's creation. But you are far better off than Adam because um, you see now, after Calvary, you see the full attributes of God. Because in creation, you were able to get in awe of his magnificence, his creativity, his wisdom, his holiness. But how about his grace? How about his love? How about his long-suffering? How about gospel grace? We talked about a little bit about the, the sexual addict the other day. He knows you now. I'm talking, about, I'm talking to redeemed people. He knows every pocket of your heart. And he's not disgusted. He's not surprised because he's all-knowing. And he's taking care of that, everything, on the cross of Calvary. You can, you can have a full-blown full view into grace now, what, what Adam couldn't do. So if, if this is really the purpose for my life, I'm better off than Adam. I, I'm much better off because I can live for, for the, I can see the whole range of attributes God is showing me, putting on display in creation and also in salvation. Can you see that? Um, and that is, friends, this is, this is, this is our life. This is, this is the, the center of our lives. We are worshipers. So is it fishing? Is it soccer? Is it baseball? Is it clothing? Is it the iPhone? W what are you living for? Um, what fuels your heart? That is the, the, the next part we want to cover. Um, because you are geared for worship, there's, there's no way around. You, you have to worship. It's not an option. But you are, you're made for him and for the worship of the creator and the savior of this world rather than just for the worship for yourself. Um, there's, there's so much more to see than our physical eyes can see, to be in awe of. And that is God and his attributes put, put on full display um, especially at the cross. Um, we, we don't have time for... I'm sorry, I didn't look at the clock. When is the time to stop? Uh, quarter two. Uh, we, we don't have time for that, but I, I, I beg you, study, study the... I don't know what the English word for it is. The, all the talks Christ had with his disciples before he went to the cross. 
It starts in John 13, 14, and, and, and he never changes topics. It's 14, 15, 16, and the climax is 17, okay? And you know this um, high priestly prayer, is that how you call it? Um, just one verse from John. I shared that with our uh, council board the other year. John 17, verse 5. And um, let me read. I am so sorry. I... Does anybody have an NASB? Because the ESV, it, it's not that easy to translate that verse. The ESV reads, And now, Father, glorify me, and ESV says, in your own presence. But the, the Greek word is para. And para is like para church alongside. So actually what he's saying is, glorify me alongside with you. Okay? Alongside with you, with the glory that I had with you, not before I came into the world, but before the world was. Most of the commentators say, okay, Christ is saying he's, he's just about to go back to his Father, and he wants to go back to eter in, in, in his eternal glory and wants to be glorified in eternity. I don't agree with that interpretation because the text says, and now. You get that? And now. And it is his farewell talk from chapter 14, 15, 16, 17. And what is now? What is, what is he preparing his disciples for? What is the next event? It's not the ascension. It's his death at the cross. And now, glorify me alongside with you, Father, with the glory we had before the world was ever started. We think in the Garden of Gethsemane, that's how we say Gethsemane, um, Christ would have prayed about the cup that this is the cross. Again, I disagree. Christ never prayed things like, I don't want to go to the cross. I'm sorry, this was the very purpose he was created for, given a body to, to give a, a, his body as a ransom. If he would have prayed for, I don't want to go to the cross, that means he would have prayed against the will of his Father. And you know what we call that? We call that sin. And Christ was without sin. The cup was, Lord, I have, Father, I have never, ever been separated from you. Never, ever. And please, if this is possible, let this cup pass, that I don't have to suffer. This is something we should actually suffer. <laughs> Separation from God. And it's so bad, we can get along quite well without God, right? It's so bad. But Christ, he's our role model. He is our prototokos, our, um, yeah, our role model. <laughs> um, firstborn, the Bible says. Um, this, was, this was a devastating thought to him. But he wanted to go to the cross, and you know why? This is the answer. John 17, 5. The cross gave Christ the ultimate opportunity to put God's character on display. It is so sad that we don't get excited about his creation as we should, especially about strawberries. <laughs> but it is as sad, it's even more sad, that we don't get really excited about his salvation as we should. I, I compare ourselves many often like with, with the birds on those high voltage cables. <laughs> In Germany at least, it's 220,000 volts running through that cable. Or, in some cases, 380,000 volts. And the birds, I know about physics, I know why, but anyways, it's a good example. And the birds, they sit on those cables, and what do they feel? Nothing. <laughs> and that is you, and that is me, many times when we look at the cross of Calvary. This is, it's not the entrance ticket for us. It is the greatest display of the attribute of God 
you will ever find in this universe. And, and that's a source which will never, ever uh, become dry. This is a love. You can always kindle your love at the cross of Christ. I, 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 I try to. <laughs> it's not too easy in your language. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit knows all the languages. Um, I, w I, was, I was up to t talk about grace for this last session with you, and there's no other way around. You, you, have, you will be excited. You want to be excited, and you have to learn sooner or later. Eventually, you'll all learn it. We'll all learn it in eternity, but it's better to do it now. It's a much better life. It is, this is your best life ever. I can quote him, but I don't agree with him. <laughs> this is your best life ever, to live for that glory. That's what you're geared for, and that's a, that's a life worth for it. it and um, there's only, um, well, the question is, what really fuels your heart? And that's, that's a core, that is maybe the core question in counseling. You got a robust understanding, I guess, now from, from the setup, from the anatomy of, of man and how he functions, the heart, and, and what he's geared to, worship, he has to be excited. And, and, and obviously, the question, the question of questions is now, what am I really worshiping? What am I, what, 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 what am I after? To give you an example, when, when you ask an alcoholic, uh, who comes to you and wants to get set free from his alcoholism, why? Why do you want to be set free? You know what usually the answer is? I lost my job. I lost my family. I lost my house and property. I lost my church. I lost my recognition. I, 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 I. It is still all about self. And, and the alcohol is, in a sense, it's not the real problem. I'm, very, I'm, I'm going out to that man, and I'm, I'm suffering with him, because why? He has bought into a lie. He wants to solve problems by abusing some substance, and the benefit he gets from, for a very short period of time, because he doesn't know how to handle his problems properly. But the, the main problem is, what is he geared to? What is he up to? What is he living? If he wants to get out of alcohol just because I, 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 I have lost all those things, this might be called therapy then. But if you don't show him the true meaning of life and that this is the pathway out of any addiction, the best you can aim for is just, and I, I'll, I'll explain that a little better, you'll just exchange idols. You will build up a new idol, idol of self-esteem, self or recognition. I want to be recognized again. And those idols can be very strong, so strong that you really leave the bottle. But what kind of service have you done? You have the most glorious task description a man can have, you are to bring, to bring him back into the posi position God had ordained for him in the first place, to be a true, faithful worshiper of the true living creator and, and savior of the universe. And that sets him free from not only alcohol, but any other idol. But you see, the, the question is, what, what are you really what are you really living for? What, what, what rules your heart? Um, there's a great passage in Ezekiel 14. Um, let's, let's take the time and, and turn to Ezekiel 14, 1 to 5. Um, because here you see how tricky our heart can be. Jeremiah joins the same message in Jeremiah 17. We'll look at that as well. In Ezekiel 
14, we, we read in the first five, five verses, Then certain of the elders of Israel came to me and sat before me, and the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, these men have taken their idols into their hearts and set the stumbling blocks of their iniquity before their faces. Should I indeed let myself be consulted by them? Therefore, speak to them and say to them, so says the Lord God, any one of the, of the house of Israel who takes his idols into his heart, into his heart, and sets the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and yet comes to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him as he comes with the multitude of his idols, that I may lay hold of the hearts of the house of Israel who are all and strangled from me through their idols. This is a very sad passage and, and time in the ministry of the prophet Ezekiel because it is the right people, it is the right God, and they're doing the right thing out of a wrong motive. It is the right people. They're doing the right thing. They come to the living God. They want to ask him questions but they do it out of a wrong motive. There was something else which has grabbed their heart. Something else has grabbed their, their being geared for worship. And there weren't, their hearts weren't for the living God. They were for other idols. And please don't, when you read especially the Old Testament or when you go to Thailand or South, South, Southeast Asia, don't believe idols are just these mech, Mac, uh, great or big uh, um, Buddha statues. I guess there's at least as much idolatry in Canada and Germany as you find in Bangkok in those temples. Because anything, uh, John Cal Johannes Calvi and John Calvin, he, he came up with the sentence, our hearts are a true idol factories. Man can turn anything into an idol. Um, just to give you a few examples, uh, performance in sports or in business and in, in your job can turn into an idol. If this gives you more um, satisfaction than you get from your relationship with the living God, it has the tendency to be an idol. Or... You want respect, you want reputation, you want prestige. Pastors can be idol worshipers. I'm sure I've, per, I, I've uh, preached message, messages, especially in my early ministry life. I wasn't in, even not for the congregation, at least for the glory of God. I was for expository preaching. And I'm still in for expository preaching. I firmly believe I have to be faithful to the author's intent. But I just wanted to show how great I did by doing my study and, and have the congregation be in awe of my message. And this is one of the worst things which can happen because the church itself has only one reason to exist, for its glory, right? And then there's a pastor behind the pulpit showing off his expertise in, in his, of his study room. Power, control, success, comfort, pleasure, Pleasure is a big thing in, in my life. Um, easy or carefree life, love of money or possessions or material things, health, sporting performance, appearance, even justice can become an idol. <laughs> that's, that's a little hard to process, but justice can become an idol. I'll just give you one little help if, if this is a problem with you. God, when he went to the cross, in his son Jesus Christ, was not in for justice. He was in for grace. <laughs> if he was in for justice, you wouldn't and I wouldn't be here. Family, marriage, kids, independence, and also stimulants like drugs and alcohol or food or sex or other things can turn into an idol. This is pretty obvious. What is not so obvious, so an idol is anything and everything which gives me more satisfaction, more comfort, more hope, more peace 
than my creator and savior. And do you see the picture? Everything can turn into an idol. And, uh, and the, the sad or tricky thing is even good things can turn into an idol. On this list, you saw many good things, many good things to be enjoyed. But if I, if I say in my heart, I have to have it in order to be happy, Christ, then I'm saying Christ is not enough. This is the ultimate, um, in German we say, lachmus test, litmus test, close, <laughs> close. Uh, this is the ultimate litmus, litmus test. Um, you know this, uh, you, you know Paul in his letter to the, to the Philippians? To live for me is blank. That is the litmus test. If you fill in anything else than Christ, it's an idol. Because you cannot continue the verse. To live for me is basketball. No idea whether you play basketball, you guys. <laughs> no, you don't. To live for me is um, a Ford Mustang with I don't know how many cylinders. <laughs> then to die is no gain. If for me to live is sex, then to die is no gain. If for me to live is family, a spouse, kids to be loved then to die is no gain there's only one who or with other words Christ is not willing to share his place with anybody or anything else in your heart or in your counselee's heart aim big aim high and on this pathway your counselee and also your life will be healed in a proper sense. Um, so this is, a, this is a core question in, in counseling. What, what is really your heart revolving around? Um, and, and then when you get that right, then it's obvious only a change of worship can really solve the problem. It, nothing less. Uh, anything else, and you'll see that in a little diagram soon, anything less would be just, the best you can do is behavioral therapy. But when you, when you understand that you're living out of your heart, when you understand you are geared for worship, you're geared for transcendence, you're, geared, you're, you're made for something bigger, nothing less will ever satisfy your heart, than Christ alone. And he satisfies. And we'll, we'll talk about that at the very end when Christ gives counsel to the woman at the well. Only a change of worship will really help. It, it needs that, that change in power and that change in worship. Not only to get set free from our interpersonal problems, but especially from our problem we have with the Lord himself. Again, I, was, I didn't come here to, to give you too many names, but, and I'm out of here tomorrow, but there's one more name. Have you ever read the book, The Five Love Languages? Or is that the name? Yeah. I, I just know the German title. <sighs> Gary Chapman, right. Moody Bible. And Moody is a good school, <laughs> except for their approach to counseling. And there are many good schools out there, but they, they are not converted yet when it comes to counseling. But they will get there. Uh-oh. I'm already in trouble. What is wrong with the five love languages? I, I'm referring to that book many often, often back home because it's very famous back home, even in Germany. I mean, there are many pastors out there. there they say this is the number one most important uh, uh, marriage book you, you, you have to read. It's the must-read. The five law of languages. Just one question. It's a harsh question. What is biblical? What is gospel-centered about this book? It is not against Christianity. 
It's not, there's nothing in this book which is wrong. There's nothing in this book which is bad or evil. Nothing. Zero. But, you know, if we find the solution for our marriage just in a little bit more communication, a little, a little bit more gifts, a little bit of more attention, and you don't see the vertical problem of your husband, that he's an idol worshiper, and you are one of these idols, then it won't help if he becomes a better communicator. It, the, the opposite is true. It might be that he is using communication to abuse you even more, to get what he wants from you as his idol. The real problem is not in the horizontal. And, this, and no, no wonder this book was bestseller, number one, Times Magazine, for months or whatever. So that means many unbelievers enjoyed that book thoroughly, obviously, because it is not against Christ, against the gospel, but it's without Christ. It's without the gospel. If we can help ourselves by just be becoming better communicators and giving more gifts and learning the love language of my spouse, it is very humanistic. And it does not get to the core problem. It is a worshiping heart which might abuse the spouse as one of his idols. You, you, you get the idea? You're, we are worshipers, and we have to address the problem on the worship level, on the heart level, and not on the behavior level. And once you have done that, you know what you give him to read? The Five Love Languages. And it's a good book. Start with, when sinners say, I do, or with uh, Instruments in the Redeemer's Hands, or many good counseling books, starts with those. And then, no problem, you know, then you can go to, um, to, the, to the second part. But never, ever start with that or think this is all you need in counseling. Okay, um, where are we? So only a true change of worship will help. You all know Luke 9, and I ask you to still turn there. Luke 9, 23. Jesus clearly sets out the pathway of following him, of being a follower of Jesus Christ. And in verse 23 of Luke 9, he, he says, And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Give up your kingdom. Stop living for your own kingdom. Deny yourself. Take up the cross. You know, the cross for us, there's a huge cross at that building, and we have a huge cross in our sanctuary. There's nothing wrong with that. But the cross today is very different from the cross back then. The cross today for us only conveys more or less the love of Christ. Back then, you know what the cross was? It was an instrument of death. It is like, I mean, I have a cross... I, I'm not wearing it any longer, but there, I have something I can hang around my little neck, and it's a silver cross. It, it, it is like as if I would use an electric chair in, in nice silver and, and hang it around my neck. That's what he's talking about. It is nothing less than the death to your own kingdom. Don't settle for less. We really have to, to, uh, and, uh, to die to ourselves and then, follow me. And Christ's charge to, to die to ourselves is not because he, he doesn't mean well. The reason for that is Christ knows the true life, your true life, is only to be found after your death. You have to die before you live, so you live before you die. That's a German author who wrote that book. But that's a very true statement on Austrian, actually. He's with the Lord already. Um, whenever I live for self-glorification, the kingdom of self, um, I'm actually denying my true humanity because I'm not made for myself. I'm made for God. And Christ knows that. And that's why he's asking for your death. 
The little kingdom of self promises true life, but it brings death. And the big kingdom requires my death, but it brings life. To jealously hold on to my dream of what I want to accomplish, what I want to experience, what I want to enjoy, is to guarantee that I will never, ever experience the true life. Those are quotes from A Quest for More from Paul Tripp. It's one of my favorites, and it is on the book table. I've recommended so many books. I'm sorry, Heinz. I've recommended so many books which are not there because I didn't communicate them. It's my fault. But this is on the table, A Quest for More. So leave the room soon to get the last copy uh, of that book. Only a change of worship will really help. This is the time when I hope our tech guys can do that. This is the time when I would like to ask you to turn to that diagram. Or is it, maybe it's not prepared for being, oh yeah, it is. Um, this is, we want to use those last 20 minutes to sum it up with this diagram. I'll do that diagram pretty short because uh, we actually have talked about everything you see on that diagram without seeing the diagram yet. The first thing I want you to, I think I even have my clicker with me. Yeah. The first thing I want you to notice on this diagram is the bottom line <laughs> right here. Um, because this separates any tree from that what you can see and that what you can see, which is the roots, right? The root level. There's a, there's a fruit level and there's a root level, okay? The sun is the, the circumstances. Uh, or maybe I should start a little earlier. The reason why, not me, but David Paulison came up with this diagram is it is helpful to have, to have a map of the whole thing. When, I mean, now we use GPS, but... If I were to find my way in Toronto, I'm very grateful for a good map, right? To, to get the picture, how do I get to Front Street? How do I get to that beautiful market and to the aquarium? And that's why David Paulson came up with this. It's not his invention, by the way. This is from scripture. This is Jeremiah 17, 1 to 5. You find that on the very top left, uh, you can read Jeremiah, uh, this, this quote. Or you also know about Psalm 1. Uh, that's where, where this idea is from. Or Luke 6. We read Luke 6, right? The Lord himself is comparing our lives with a tree, okay? And that's where David Paulson got this idea from. Why don't, if we want to come up with a map which explains the whole process of biblical counseling, why not using that biblical diagram, this biblical example, okay? So, the most important thing you have to see first is there is a fruit level and there's a root level. And I don't have to repeat myself. What are, we, what are we in for? What are we looking at as a biblical counselor? For the fruit? No, for the root. Not for the fruit level. Uh, when somebody comes to you in counseling, he will tell you how he feels about his emotions, what he did what words he expressed in his actions, what he thought, what, and it gets closer, but it's still the surface level, and what his attitude was along the whole thing. And you will also see his reactions, you know, like he became angry because the wife didn't have supper ready when he came home. But this is, you know, don't talk about communication then with this couple. This is just fruit level, and those are bad fruit in the lives of a husband, for instance, okay? Uh, even masturbation, what we talked about yesterday, and pornography, that's a fruit. It is a bad fruit, but it comes from a heart which is worshiping, which is longing to be satisfied in the wrong place, very close to alcoholism. Alcoholism is idol worship. Masturbation, or let's say the whole illicit, all illicit forms of sex are idol worship, because behind 
all our being is a heart. And in the heart, to get to the heart, I have to ask questions like, what is fueling your behavior? What did you expect? What did you crave? What, what is your desire? What do you want to have? Or what do you believe you must have? Those are hard questions. I, I, I really recommend to you an article from the CCF journal. It's, it must be available also without having the journal. Uh, Vanity Fair uh, and the Idols of the Heart by David Paulison. He explains it so well for a counselor. We want to aim for the root level. And, and he's put out 33 or 36 questions, which all go towards the heart, to reveal the heart. Uh, and, and by the way, the counselee doesn't have to reveal his heart necessarily before you. He has to reveal his heart before the Lord, and first of all, before himself, to see clearly what he was really aiming for. Okay? Why do we have two trees? Because there are there are in a sense, there are two hearts. I mean, in the break, during the break, somebody said, don't we have a new heart? Yes, we do have a new heart. Yes, we do have the Holy Spirit. And yes, Galatians 5, there's still the old flesh. And we are battling the old flesh. So even as a believer, we can still go to <clears throat> the old life, which is a heart which wanted, wants to please self, right? And this is revealed through those questions. Um, and where we all want to go to ourselves and also our, for our cons counselees, we hope that we will all be found in our different life situations on the other side, which is a heart which really wants to please your creator and your savior. And he, he has given you every reason to be ignited, to be excited about him in creation and in salvation, right? Uh, and this heart, you know, if you live from that heart, you will bring good fruit in spite of the same circumstances. I give you, I give you an example. You're living with a husband um, who who is um, into some sort of um, okay, let's not do it so drastic. Well, we can, do, we can use the example of yesterday. Why not? You find out, it just happened in our church when we talked about sexual purity. The, the husband opened up to his wife that he was still using pornography and, and also masturbation alongside. And the, the, the wife was, she was shocked because usually wives, somehow they know actually and they cover it up, but she didn't. And this was such a blow against the marriage. But anyways, um, even though this might be hard now for you, the wife can react on that side. She can be disgusted. She can yell at him. She can pull his hair out. She can do whatever harm she could do to him. That's true. The question is, is that righteous anger or is that sinful anger? Is she angry because he has sinned against God? Okay, then I stop arguing. Then he can lose some hair. <laughs> but that's very rare that we develop righteous anger. Most of the time, it is selfish anger. She, she feels betrayed. I understand that. She feels used or abused or whatever, pushed to the side, worthless. But wait a minute. The wife is also a worshiper. Why do you feel worship, uh, uh, selfless? Uh, I'm sorry, worthless. Where did you get your worth from in the beginning? What is your true identity? Was it marriage? Was it your husband? What is your vital relationship you're living in? So if the wife, I know that, that's really a hard example, but I think this, and it is true also in, in lives of our congregation or in marriages it happened, if, if the wife really learns, okay, it is sinful, I'm not covering it, I'm not commending it, but I want to show a reaction which not pleases self, but pleases God. How is God handling sin, right? He was loving. 
he showed off his love at the cross of Calvary, being full aware of my sinfulness and your sinfulness, right? So the main, the main thing why you are living is to bring glory to God. You know what? I, I, I make a bold statement now. A wife would still, with God's help, and we, we will come to the center. That is very crucial. A wife which still needs, which still loves her husband, even though she more and more finds out what kind of guy she got married to. If she still loves him, loving in a, in a biblical way means I want the best for you, okay? Her worship, her love is probably pure or more valuable in the eyes of the Lord than a wife which is always treated as, as it's at its best, always carried on hands. Because this wife, she doesn't really know why she loves her husband. Does she love him because of Christ? Or does she love him because he gives me all I was lo looking for, at least for the first couple of months and years, right? <laughs> I, I, this was a stark statement. I understand that. But believe me, to live for Christ enables you and, and brings fruit forth in your life which you could never, ever achieve out of your own, okay? And, and therefore, we really have to talk about the center, and the center is a cross. That's why it's called the three-tree diagram. One tree, second tree, third tree. And the, 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 the third tree is the core of it all. You can't do that from yourself. You don't have the power to live with a sinner and even to love a sinner. You can't do that. But if you are connected to Christ and his cross, if you do the Matthew 18 thing, the very end, if you are daily nurturing from this grace he has bestowed and is bestowing and will be bestowing on you, Titus 2, you will get the strength to live on the other side of the spectrum, to live a life pleasing to God and not pleasing to self. Okay? Um, that's why I have those red... Um, that was quick, but... Th th that's why I had those red um, quotations down there. I added those. Uh, David did not have those in the original. Um, the indicative always comes before the imperative. I think we talked about that a little bit. Ephesians 1 to 3, the first three chapters, it's all about who you are in Christ. And therefore, chapter 4 to 6, that's how you should live now in Christ. Okay? But you, and that's important for your counselees. You have to give them grace. If you just give them the law, what to do, without grace, they feel more defeated because they didn't do well before they met you. And now you raise the bar and make it even more difficult for them just telling them what they are to do and what to not to do. You ha it is so true. We have to give them grace first. But then this grace has to lead to something. And th those are all the, always those transitional verses. Ephesians 4, verse 1. Romans 12, verse 1. Colossians 3, verse 1 and 2. Read those verses and see the transition. Um, that um, you... You always need the indicative, who you are in Christ. You need that love from Christ first in order to be able to um, sacrifice yourself on a daily basis. I left out that little word, but I hope you noticed that. Luke 9, 23 says, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, Daily and follow me. Daily is, is a lot of comfort because that means if you are sitting here in this conference and, and you're saying, uh, I came here to be better equipped to help others, but I get the impression I need a lot of help. <laughs> That's perfectly fine. Welcome in the club. <laughs> Daily, you have to draw from Christ. Daily, you have to see the beauty of his grace. 
daily you have to draw near from Calvary. That's why he has given us, yes, teaching, yes, fellowship, yes, prayer, and yes, the Lord's Supper. You get baptized once, but you again and again and again have to ponder on who Christ is, what he has done for you, and this gives you the strength to again and again deny yourself on a daily basis and live on the other side the true kingdom side, which gives good fruit in spite of the same circumstances. I just finished that, and, and then we come to our last example, how Christ himself did counseling. Please turn to Jeremiah 17, and I read those verses which were instrumental for this diagram we owe to David Powlison. In Jeremiah 17, we read, Jeremiah 17, verse 5. Thus says the Lord, Curses the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength. That is this side. Trusting in man, trusting in self, living for self. This man is cursed. There's no good fruit coming for a life lived for yourself and by your own strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. It's exclusive. Either you live for yourself or you live for Christ. He's like a shrub in the desert. He shall not see any good, come, any, any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Verse 7, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He's like a tree planted by water that sends out its root by the stream. And now listen and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green and, it is, and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. You see how wonderfully this diagram depicts this truth. This is just the circumstance. Your wife, which is maybe a little hard to live with, this is part of the circumstance. That's not even in the spectrum. <laughs> what, is, what really matters is you're living out of your heart. Is your heart geared for worship of self or geared for worship of God? And then if you're really drawing from the grace of Calvary, you can even, in, the, in spite of and in the midst of the difficult circumstances, you can bring good fruit. I want to use the last seven minutes to draw your attention to the Counselor Wonderful. Uh, and you please continue this study because I haven't seen anybody done that too much. And that is, that is astonishing because you guys want to learn how to do counseling, right? I want to learn how to be a better helper for other people. And who's called Counselor Wonderful? Christ himself. Show me the books written who systematically studied the counseling of Jesus Christ while he was on earth, or even in his pre-incarnate state in the Old Testament. He also did counseling. No kidding. He was talking to Abraham. He was in the wilderness. He was with the people. Who did ever study systematically? That's a good thesis. That's a, actually a thesis for a doctoral program. Do that. Study Christ as Counselor Wonderful. I just walk you through this one counseling session and then we are done for, for today or at least for, for my session. John 4, the woman at the well. John 4, verse 5. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sucha, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, buried from uh, his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. What is the sixth hour? High, do you call it high noon? The sun is burning down. Everybody is behind cold walls. There's nobody out on the street. Okay? That's not, you know about the southern hemisphere. Nobody is there or closer to the equator, I have to say, nobody's out on the street. And this, there's this woman. 
I, I can't read the whole story, and you know it anyways. We don't have the time. I just go through and explain what Jesus is doing. And there's this woman. Why is this woman coming at the sixth hour? Because she's ashamed. See, she's so ashamed of her lifestyle. You know the woman. You know it already. You, you have Christ's eyes already, right? She had five men. And the one she's living with is not her husband. And she didn't want to see the eyes of the other people who were despising her, who thought to themselves, I'm better than this bitch. I'm, I'm so glad. And aren't we all like, a little bit like those Pharisees when a woman like that would come into our congregation? What does Christ do? We didn't do anything. We, we all talked about dynamics and not about methods, but just a little hint about methods of biblical counseling. What does Christ do? He approaches her. He, he gaps the, the he, he, he bridges the gap. Many gaps. He's a man, she's a woman. In those days, this was not the way. And she, he, he bridged that gap as a man approaching that woman. He a Jew talking to a dog. That's how the Jews thought of Samaritans. And he bridges that gap. And there is even a, a, a greater gap. Nobody of you has to bridge. He's Christ, sinless. And he reaches out to that woman who's a sinner and who is caught in her sin, right? This is the first step as a biblical counseling, counselor. You have to have passport. passport. You, have to be access, you have to have access to the heart of your counselee. And you are far better off because you are a sinner. And, and he has not to repent before you, the counselee. What you, your task is you grab him by the hand and you both together walk to the throne of grace. That's your task. Because you need the very same grace every day. And you're just a helper. And you bring him or her to the throne of grace, right? So that's the first step, have access. And then Jesus talks to the woman. May I ask you a question? You know the woman. It's, she's from your town, from your village. Or David, she's in your congregation, and you find out what she has done, okay? I, I don't know you, and, and if I know you, I know you wouldn't do better, but now I, I just say the chances are high that we as counselors go into the wrong direction and approach her right at the problem, right? We're aiming right at the, what? I heard you had five men sleeping around with other men, and now you still have, you're in a relationship and you're not married to him, and you, you, you also sleep around with this guy? You see how... How, how, how we attempted to write to go to, the, to what we think is the problem. But I, I beg you, this is not the problem. Did you learn that during those days? What is her sleeping around? You know what that is? Those are rotten apples hanging in the tree. That's not the problem. The problem is her heart. Her heart is on the wrong side. She's still living for self-gratification. She still believes the lie of Satan that the life lived for herself is the only and the best life you can ever experience. You see that? And that's where Christ starts. That is wise. That is wisdom. He tells that woman, um, if, give, me, give me a drink. She, doesn't, she, doesn't, she gives, Maybe she gives him the drink, but he, he, he does the Jewish thing. He, comes, he goes from the known to the unknown. He, he, he uses physical thirst, is that a word? Physical thirst as an example to show her there's something else. There's spiritual thirst you have. If you knew the gift of God, who, is, who, is, who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and we, he would have given you living water. And she, he gets, she gets her interest but she didn't get the point yet. And then Christ continues his teaching about 
living water, living on the right side of the spectrum. Whoever drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become a spring of living water, water welling up to eternal life. And probably not every word is recorded, but this woman, she got the message, I'm sure. She, he opened, he's the wonder, counselor, wonder, counselor Wonderful. So he shows that woman, woman, there's something you, you haven't even tasted yet. You are licking from dirt, but you are to enjoying the best food ever, relationship with the living God. You are geared for relationship. I know that because I've created you. You need relationship. But you are looking for satisfaction in the wrong place. You're using, you, you think sex is the right thing to fulfill your needs and, and, and your, you as a relational being. But that's not true. Your true need is absolutely filled. Your thirst is quenched at my well. You can have relationship with a living God. And then, yes, he, he has a straight talk. He, he, after that, after he has opened up the three-tree diagram, if you want to, he, he tells her, go and get your husband. Oops. Yes, in counseling, we have to talk about sin in a most gracious and a most informed and wise way. You see that? And then, I don't have a husband. Oh, yeah, you, you don't have a husband. Yeah, you had five men. And the one you're sleeping around with is not your husband. And then something very, and then I, I really quit. <laughs> something really marvelous happens. And again, Mike does not agree with many commentators. The woman says, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem the place is the place where our people ought to worship. Most of the commentators say, oh, this woman is now so verlegen, help me with verlegen, that's a German word, she's so um, intimidated, she changes topics about theology and worship. And I tell you, wrong. This woman got the message. She's much smarter than many commentators. She realized it's about worship. It's about relationship with the living God. So help me. How does it work? I'm a Samaritan. My fathers have told me I'm to go up to our mountains and worship there this, this God, these gods. Is that true? Or is, you, is your God the right one? He gives her the answer, hey, you guys are wrong. This is idol worship, what your fathers did in Samaria to keep you from going down to Jerusalem. We are we, we are worshiping the right God. This is the well, the true source of living water. But you know what? And here comes the conclusion. You worship what you don't know. We worship what we know. That's the correction. For salvation is from the Jews, yes. But, and please take this back home. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father not in Samaria, not in Jerusalem, not, 1 Kings 8, facing Jerusalem, looking where's east or west or wherever you are in the world, facing Jerusalem. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to go out of your way. The time has come when the true worshipers worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Means, what woman... It is freely accessible to you. You even don't have to come down to the temple anymore, as the Jews had to do every year, once a year. You can have this, this sweet, this overwhelming, this satisfying fellowship with the true creator and savior, your savior of the universe, right now, wherever you are, at your disposal, in spirit. Every time. You can be, I can be in Toronto in a beautiful place. I enjoyed it thoroughly I, at, at your home. But what I really enjoyed this one morning was, and I don't have that every morning, but I had that when I looked out, 
saw the squirrels, saw a beautiful piece of Canada out there, even though it's winter, and had fellowship with my Creator. I can do that every time I want. He even asks me to. That's, that's the world upside down. I should beg him for, please, allow me. And he asks me, come, have fellowship. And this quenches your soul. This satisfies your soul. You're geared for worship. You have to worship. I beg you, quench your soul at living water, at that relationship you can have with the living God, your creator, and your savior. This was the solution for this woman. It'll be a solution for you and for any counselee. Amen? Amen. Amen.